Thank you everyone for attending. My name is uh, Jennifer McCann and I'm um, at the University of Rhode Island Coastal Resources Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant. And uh, we are working with the CRMC on the development of an aquaculture element um, as a part of the um, near Gansett Bay Special Area Management Plan. Um, just um, um, concerning logistics here, um, we are, we feel and we find here at URI and also CRMC is um, if we're able to have an in, more informal interaction information sharing process um, that we, we get better results and, and we are able to have um, uh, everybody's issues and concerns have been, will have been erased more effectively. So we're, we're pretty good at doing that in person, but obviously we're having to do this virtually. So um, we hope you bear with us on um, this virtual um, logistics. Um, and, but again, the intent is trying to mimic as much as possible um, being in an in-person meeting. So um, what, the way we're, we're going about it, we have, obviously we have the working group committee um, working group where I can, we can see your faces. You are on the working group and every, anybody on the working group um, has one link and, and that's people we can see. And then there's um, other people who want, want to engage in this process and we want you to engage in this process. Um, and um, so you all are, you are participants and the working group people are panelists in this webinar. Um, everybody is very important. I have two children, so we have to make sure everybody recognizes that everybody's very important and your questions will be answered. Um, we are each working group, you know, working group members represent either a municipality um, or a, a resource user or, um, or our researchers um, or part of the government. So um, we're, we have over 80 people on the working group. So if working group members, you would like to ask a question or have a comment, we're asking you to go into the chat room and just put the letter Q on here, all right? And I will say we have, I have two screens open of people. So if you just sort of shake your hand and, or raise it or put it, I'm gonna try to find, your, find you, okay? And call on you. But um, I will do a better job at responding to your questions if you could just cue yourself in the chat room, all right? I'm, I'm asking you to do that. Um, I will say um, in the last meeting, the East Bay meeting, they did not do a good job of that. And that was very frustrating. So let's see if the West Bay can do a better job of that. Um, if, if you are a participant and not on the working group, we are also, there's a Q&A at the bottom of your screen you are more than welcome to put a question in there and we will, we will ask that question or relay that comment appropriately in the conversation. So Kathy Dwyer and I are um, looking at both the chat and the Q and A. Um, so um, this is going, this is a recorded meeting. And so um, we will get this recording to you as soon as we can. We are also um, creating summary notes, which is like two pages summary of this meeting. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jim. Jim, you're on mute. Thank you, Jen. Sorry about that. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jim Boyd, and I'm the deputy director here at the CRMC, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all uh, this afternoon on behalf of the Coastal Resources Management Council. We're very grateful for your interest and participation as we begin this important work of the aquaculture element of the Narragansett Bay Special Area Management Plan, which we're referring simply as the Bay SAMP. The concept of this Bay SAMP began several years ago when the CRMC was reviewing a federal consistency request that was filed by the US Navy for a proposed federal activity within Narragansett Bay. At that time, we recognized 
that some of our existing policies for the waters of Narragansett Bay, many written over 40 years ago, were not nearly as comprehensive or as current as those within the Ocean Special Area Management Plan that was adopted by the CRMC in 2010. Thus, we wanted to improve upon and add more detailed policies and standards for the waters of Narragansett Bay using an ecosystem-based approach for such activities as renewable energy, water-dependent commercial and recreational uses, aquaculture, and other water-dependent activities. This was the genesis for developing a Narragansett Bay SAMP to address coastal management issues of concern within Narragansett Bay. Stakeholder engagement has been the key to developing successful SAMPs, as Jennifer just mentioned. And this has been done over the past 40 years of the Rhode Island Coastal Program. And this Bay SAMP will be the ninth special area management plan that we've developed with assistance of the URI Coastal Resources Center. When we first started development of the Bay SAMP, the issue of renewable energy was fast becoming a high priority for the state. What became evident then was the priority issue of developing a renewable energy cable corridor within state waters to provide a service connection between offshore wind farms and providing renewable energy to Rhode Island and other states. An ad hoc cable working group was established to advise the CRMC, and that effort became the first so-called element of the BASAM. This current effort to address aquaculture development within Narragansett Bay is another priority that we are now able to devote resources and time with stakeholder engagement and input to develop a comprehensive aquaculture element that will guide aquaculture applications through the existing CRMC regulatory review process. We are again engaging an ad hoc working group to advise the CRMC. Our expectation is that this aquaculture element will identify areas within Narragansett Bay that minimize impacts to natural resources and existing uses from proposed aquaculture farms through adoption of an aquaculture zone map within the CRMC regulatory program. It will look at existing information, processes, and recommendations from this working group to improve the CRMC regulatory review process. And this process will be further enhanced by engaging public stakeholders to help us collectively better understand the issues facing the natural resources, the users, and uses of the Bay. We're looking forward to working with you all as we advance this project as part of the Narragansett Bay SAMP, and thank you for your participation. Thanks, Jen. Does anyone have any general questions for Jim? Um, uh, again, we're going to go into more detail. You received a copy of the agenda, but just generally, and again, if you want to put a cue in the chat, if you have a question, that would be great. Okay. I don't see anything. So with that, Jim, do you want to talk about, uh, do, you, do you want to add anything more about the role of the working group? Yeah, yeah, I will, Jen, just um, just briefly, you know, in terms of, you know, questions have been asked about what is the role of the aquaculture element working group? Well, uh, again, it's an ad hoc group of approximately 80 stakeholders with broad representation of interests from around the Bay, including resource users, municipalities, environmental groups, state and federal government, as well as research institutions, our universities. The working group is strictly an advisory group and it has no legal or regulatory authority. We are, however, relying upon the combined expertise of the working group to assist the CRMC in putting forth ideas, suggestions, and recommendations 
for consideration as we develop the CRMC aquaculture zoning map. Any draft maps and accompanying regulatory text that the CRMC may consider for rulemaking at a later date will be the subject for public notice and public hearing, which is not anticipated to begin until next spring 2022 at the earliest. In the interim, we are relying upon the working group to play an important role in advising the CRMC throughout this process. That's what I want to say on the role of the working group, Jen. All right. So you all are members of the working group. Uh, we, we don't have an oath thing or anything like that, but do, do you all understand what your role is? Okay, I see some thumbs up. You're not getting paid. And um, again, we if if you know you are um, sounding boards and, and also if people from your community um, have a question or concern, you know, please bring it to this group. Um, we, we need your help on that. Okay. So hey Jen, just let me add one more thing because I, I know there's been a lot of interest from uh, you know, a broad segment of the public. Uh, obviously, aquaculture has been uh, in the news as of late, um, particularly on some applications in Tiverton. But um, I, I want participants and, and the public at large to know that um, we are planning on this process to hold public workshops, which will be an opportunity once we initially have some drafts pulled together and some thoughts and ideas in direction of, of which um, the recommendations that this working group has. We also wanna vet those in a very public forum. And, and the CRMC has done this in many instances over the years where we just have a public forum and we share some ideas. And in this particular case, we will make presentations and get further input from the public to help refine this process as we move forward. And the working group is gonna play a key role here in advising us and, and getting us to the goal line here of a product that works uh, to protect the interests of the state, the interests of the public in terms of the resources and the users uh, and uses uh, within the Bay. Jim, um, Larry Taft has a question. So Larry, uh, feel free to let us hear your question. Okay, the only question I have is, is anybody to represent saltwater anglers or in the recreational fishing represented in the working group? And is that uh, Fred, Fred's I his hand up? Okay. Uh, we do have, Larry, we do have a um, an extensive list, again, as Jim said, over 80 people. And mm -hmm. um, uh, we also have, a. Uh, in, I'll just say where our, the website is going to be going live in a couple of days and you can get um, on the website will, is a link to all the working group members. And so, for example, we have Susan Daly here from the Rhode Island Marine Trades Association. We have other, the Salt, Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association, um, uh, Pilot Association, uh, so all different um, resource users as well as environmental organizations such as yourself. So you'll be able to see the full list um, on, that, on that link. Thank you. <clears throat> if, you do, if you think we've missed someone, we are, please let us know. Um, each municipality has, been, um, has three representatives and we asked them to choose which, what people represent each municipality. So, some are part of the Harbor Commission, um, some's the town planner or municipal planner, um, others are, you know, um, from other commissions. So um, they, they were able to choose which three individuals represent each municipality. However, again, um, everyone is welcome to engage. I would Any, say we do, we do have then, Fred, Fred DeFinis. He's from the Saltwater, Associ uh, Saltwater Anglers Association. He's listed in our as our contact for that group. But I believe we also have invited Rich Hittinger as well. Okay. All right. Uh, so I am going to 
um, share my screen and um, talk a little bit about the time frame. If, if um, can you see my screen? Um, I'm assuming you can see my screen. Yes, Jim. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm. I'm so um, again, as Jim said, um, this is a twelve. These are these are guidelines. These are dates that we're shooting for. However, they may switch. Um, but the intent is of this schedule, this preliminary schedule, is to provide you all some guidance that we are. Um, CRMC is committed to um, doing their homework, to listening to you all and getting it right. Um, we re realize that this affects many of us and many of you in different ways. So um, we have four different stages here. Um, and again, we do this with all of our SAM. So this is not a new process. Um, so right now we are in the issue identification phase where we're communicating what the aquaculture element is, we're shaping it, and we're listening to you all as far as what your issues are, um, and also better understanding what existing research exists um, so that we are, you know, we're, we're moving forward with eyes wide open. Um, so sometime in the fall, um, to, you know, again, there's some overlocking, lapping times here, so from the, in the fall to the end of the year, um, we're going to be working with you all to identify solutions to some of these issues. Uh, and we're gonna talk about three of the deliverables or the components of the aquaculture element in a bit. Um, that's what we, we recognize that those are three things that need to be um, looked at closely, but we may identify others. Sister. So we got all that issues. We got we got eye joints we got uh, eye joints that are undersized. So I'm not sure if anybody's. Um, so anyway, so then in January to April around, we will be finalizing the revisions of these solutions, and then um, in in May or to September around we and, and and I would say from before that, all of these three steps above, these are informal settings. The, the informal uh, interactions with the public. We want to, again, identify creative and innovative solutions. So um, only when we initiate the rulemaking process, as Jim mentioned, um, likely sometime next year, will that be a formal process where we um, formally go through, again, that formal rulemaking process. So just wanted to um, share with you that um that time frame um does anyone have any questions about what jim said or what i said about the time frame i just want to know if you are all this quiet at home or if you have any other any questions Okay, with that, we will, Jim, do you want to add anything or Ben? Um, you know, the only thing, Jennifer, I, I think we may have uh, quite a bit more questions and discussion following uh, Chris Damon's presentation. I know from, from my perspective, our last meeting um, on the East Passage, uh, that Chris's presentation was very eye-opening and I think provides some really good context for people to wrap their head around this, this you know, mapping uh, uh, process. And so uh, I expect to uh, see some more questions later on. Okay. And, and Jim, you bring up a good point. Um, many of you may have attended our first meeting at the end of June. And um, based on conversations uh, um, during that meeting, there was a recommendation that potentially we hold three separate meetings, the same meetings, but based on sub-regions. So, um, and Ben, ben um, really uh, was highlighting this as far as looking at the biosecurity zones. So 
Again, we had a meeting um, for the East Passage. This is the meeting for West Passage. And um, we will be scheduling um, an event for Sakonet um, later on. That one we had to reschedule. So, um, so we are, our intent is to be as responsive as possible to your needs. Uh, so let's go to the next section, which is looking at the different aquaculture elements. And uh, so we're asking um, Chris Damon to uh, begin this presentation. Chris just put something in the chat room. And um, Kathy, if you could share that with the all participants, that would be great. And um, uh, so Chris Damon is from the University of Rhode Island and will share uh, with you some of what he's been up to. Thank you, Jen. Well, I think Jim's, uh, classification as a presentation is a bit overstated on this. Um, that's, it's not uh, nearly as formal. What is coming through the chat is, uh, you can all see a map on your screens, I hope, very good. And so as part of the Environmental Data Center here on the, the main campus, my role in the working group is always map and data guy. And as a map and data guy, one of the things that we found to be very useful in these uh, forums is to assemble all of the information that we're talking about into a single picture that people can all look at, a common, a common frame of reference. And that's what we've done here. And so I'm going to briefly describe the, the interface. This link is open. Uh, there's two things I wanna start off by saying. One is uh, the link is open to everybody. And I encourage you to bookmark this site because this is uh, a dynamic map. Unlike in the past where we would distribute paper maps for meetings, this is now being updated as we receive feedback from these different meetings. So um, please bookmark this link and uh, you will always be looking at the most current version that, that has been released. Um, the second, piece is that all of the data that you're going to be seeing as I step through it quickly is all coming from authoritative sources. So I am not holding in my computer here at the university any of these data. These are coming from uh, NOAA or Rhode Island DEM or um, the state GIS. So we are looking at information streaming directly from these organizations. So this is the best information that, that I have available. Uh, third and final point is if you believe information to be lacking or you would like additional layers for context, please let us know. With that, looking at this map, you will see that there is quite a bit of yellow on the map. And we have uh, intentionally colored all of these features that are being considered hard constraints the same color so that uh, it, it just makes it easier when you have a lot of overlapping data sets to look at them. And as we zoom in on the map, some of the data sets that we're, that we're looking at here, you will notice if a data set has a, a, a normal eyeball, it's visible, or it can be turned off if there's a slash through it. Right. So each one of these data sets that we're looking at, they're coming from multiple sources and it allows you to turn on and off the different data sets to see how they're contributing to the whole for restricted areas. So we have uh, I've done uh, what I think is an, a, an, a decent job of grouping these layers into some type of groupings that make sense. So we have marine transportation layers. And you will see that uh, we have a group name, so marine transportation, and then each layer has its own name, in this case, uh, the dredge navigation channels, and then the source. So you can see at a glance where these data are coming from and, and who the authoritative source is. We have uh, natural areas that include uh, eelgrass, both current. The most current we have is 2016, though that is being updated this year, the imagery has already been flown. And we have past eelgrass, uh, a, a whole series of years merged together from 2006 through 2012. 
and then some offshore areas for the Narragansett Bay um, Research Reserve. We have research and monitoring that is the shellfish spawner sanctuaries, the seal monitoring sites, oyster research areas. This is also where the biosecurity zones fall under, uh, come into, into play. And in some of these, for clarity, some of these data sets have, have been turned off just, just to keep things clear. And then shellfish harvest restrictions. So prohibited areas, conditional closure areas, again, they've been turned off, but you can turn them on to see what additional areas are, are blocked out in the bay. And uh, we have existing aquaculture locations. This is permitted aquaculture, current permitted aquaculture in fish trap locations. And also uh, what we're calling ancillary later layers, or I am at this point. And these are things that are not necessarily hard constraints that would prevent aquaculture from occurring in a location, but they help provide context that other uh, participants have indicated would be helpful. So we have things like the CRMC rights of way points or boat ramp locations or an approximate mean high, high water line. For any of these layers, if there is background information on the map and you click on the map on a location, you will see that um, it takes you, uh, again, it'll, the title will tell you the group that the data layer is within. So in this case, it's the marine transportation. And this happens to be a danger zone or restricted area. And then some of the uh, additional information that, that goes along with that is available in the table where multiple data sets um, overlap, in this case, the, they become darker. You see a darker yellow where multiple data sets overlap. So if we click on this area here, our table, when it opens, our, our little window says that there's one of two. That means there's two different data sets that are overlapping in this location. The first is that marine transportation uh, danger zone that we talked about. The little arrow would take you to the second one, which is the other layer that covers this area is a shellfish, shellfish harvest restriction polygon and some information that, that uh, we have for that polygon. So uh, yeah, I don't think there's, there's a reason to, um, to, to pound on this too hard. I think most folks will be quite comfortable with the interface. It's very similar to Google Earth where you can pan and zoom it and click. But if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to reach out and, and answer. I will answer the questions as best I can or if you have problems accessing. But hopefully everybody is able to see this. If not, send me a, a message and I will, I will fix any problems. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and answer questions. Chris. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I do actually, um, because uh, thank you, Chris. That was, uh, that was a helpful explanation and tour of this uh, mapping tool that you've put together. Uh, you've mentioned the term hard constraint. So I, I want to throw out what we believe to be a a definition of hard constraints so people have a better uh, idea of how that applies here to the map. So for our purposes of the BASAMP, uh, we're, we're thinking that the term hard constraint means a GIS map layer that uh, depicts where the CRMC in accordance with state or federal regulations would prohibit aquaculture activity within Narragansett Bay. So some examples of hard constraints would include like the Department of Defense restricted zones within the Bay that are defined in federal statute uh, at 33 CFR section 334, uh, which do not permit any vessel under any circumstances to anchor or fish or tow a drag of any kind within that prohibited area. Other examples of hard constraints include uncertified waters, that is uh, restricted 
shellfish harvest areas as defined by the National Shellfish Sanitation Program and areas of submerged aquatic vegetation, eelgrass and widgeon grass, for example. These are specified in the CRMC Red Book um, in the aquaculture section of the Red Book, section 1.3.1K. Those are hard constraints. Um, so those are the ones that we've identified to date. Uh, Chris has some of those on, on his map now, and we're considering other issues for discussion in purpose of putting in context in this map. Uh, Jim, uh, Lisa Breyer has a question. So go ahead, Lisa. Also, um, for those of you with questions, please put a cue in the chat and I will call on you. Thank you. I, I just had a question about, I'm looking online at the aquaculture sites. And I'm not sure whether all of the sites in Dutch Harbor are updated because it looks like the old, and maybe they just haven't abandoned it yet, the old Walrus and Carpenter site near the mouth of the creek there is still there. But it looks like maybe their new site is just not labeled. There's a square there maybe. And there was another new one that, um, and maybe they're not approved yet. There was a couple that came through this winter that I thought were approved. I just want to make sure that they're on there. So, yes, there may be, um, I, I don't have a definitive answer for you. There may be uh, polygons that are missing. If uh, these data are, are coming directly from a DEM server that we're pulling from, so if they haven't been updated yet, then, um, then I'm sure they will in, in the near future, on whatever their, their update schedule is. And, but if you do notice discrepancies that, that persist, please let us know and we, I can investigate further. I believe right now we're only showing approved um, aquaculture sites. That is correct. Right, so some of those sites, that, Lisa, that you're maybe looking for um, have not been registered as, as approved or, or they're in, you know, in, in an earlier phase of application review. So if you went to the DEM Marine Fisheries map, um, you would see all those different uh, levels of you know, uh, application review, whether it be preliminary determination, which is your pre-application known as a PD, or it might be listed as a PN, which would mean that it was publicly noticed and pending uh, final decision. But um, yes, the Walrus and Carpenter site is, has not been uh, fully relinquished yet. Uh, they are on a timeline to do that uh, within the next year or so. I, I think, and, and um, one thing I, I keep forgetting to request, if when you um, say talk, if you could just say who you're representing, that would be great. Uh, um, Lisa, we know you're from Jamestown. Town of Jamestown. Larry, uh, yep, and um, Larry Taft from Audubon. Um, uh, Julia Livermore wanted to um, uh, just add something to that point. So Julia Livermore from DEM. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Julia Livermore. I'm with the Division of Marine Fisheries and it's it's our office that works on putting that layer together on the active sites. So if you ever see any discrepancies, give us a call. Um, but I did wanna ask, is, is it updating directly from the server? So when we make our updates, it's automatically gonna update on this map or is there anything you need from us to make sure that goes smoothly, I guess is my question. No, thanks, Julia. It, this is pulling directly from from the DEM map server. So when it's updated on your side, <clears throat> excuse me, those changes are automatically reflected on this map. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the next question, Charles, and then Dick. Go ahead, Charles. Go ahead. Chip, was, right, Chip. Chip, yes. I was surprised to see that there's no zone down the navigation in Sakana River. There's a clear navigation channel marked with buoys all the way down the river. Big craft of various kinds, commercial fishermen, a ferry goes through there, large sailboats, many other boats go down there. It's no place to put aquaculture. It should be marked off as such. So we have the defined navigation channels as they're coming off of the, the NOAA 
electronic nautical charts, the, the dredge channels. There are other channels as I'm, I'm looking at this, particularly within the Sakonet. Um, the, the last, let me just share my screen again. Are we seeing a map again? Not yet, Chris. Coming on now. Yeah. There you oh, go. Okay, very good. So, so the the last layer, um, it, it can be a little bit cumbersome to work with, um, but it's called it's the raster nautical chart layer that's put out. Again, this is coming directly from NOAA, and if you zoom into a, a location, let me turn off some stuff. And you turn on the, the raster nautical chart. As you zoom in, the chart will, will um, update. And what we, what we have for the marine transportation layers mirrors this. It's, it comes from both NOAA and the Corps of Engineers. And so the channels that are marked, this one, I know that there is one missing in, in and around Quonset. Um, I would have, yeah. yep, this is a Sakana. I would have to, to look, this isn't showing up as, as necessarily a marked channel. Um, the way the buoys, the buoys are run, the, the dotted uh, magenta line represents something else. So I, I hear, I, you know, it's clearly on the nautical charts that there's buoys and, but it's not, it's not, um, it doesn't meet the definition that we're using. If that needs to be included, then we can talk amongst, <clears throat> excuse me, the group and figure out the best way to represent that so that it's, um, so that it's clear for everybody that, that is, there is indeed a channel in there, that area. So, so Chris, just for clarification here, um, so what's shown on the NOAA chart would be, uh, um, all recognized federal navigation channels. Right, so, so if you get up into, you know, the, let me turn this off. If you get up into the Providence River area, this channel is marked in a, in a much different fashion than we were just looking at in the Sakonet. Same mm -hmm. thing going over into Mount Hope Bay. You have, you have these dredge channels that are, are clearly marked. That is not the case in the Sakonet. They don't have that on the charts themselves. What, what are they called? What is that called, Chris, on the chart? Do we know? Uh, let me see. On the charts, they would be called just navigation channels. And so um, Noah puts out all of the individual layers that go into building this chart as individual layers. And I pulled the one called, you know, the navigation channels to get you these, these types of features that we're seeing up here, in this case, in Mount Hope Bay, right? And they overlay with, with, the, uh, with the layers that we have. I can go back and dig deeper into, because there are hundreds of layers that go into these charts. I can go back and dig a bit deeper to see if there is something that better defines the a, a navigation channel in this area, but my guess is if it's not, um, I'm not super familiar with this area on this side. So if I, if it's not being dredged actively, then then Noah may not have anything um, for their chart, and we would have to look at other ways to represent that type of information. Chris, if you just just draw a line, connect the green buoys and connect the red buoys, you're going to have a defined navigation channel. Well, not, not necessarily. It gets pretty squirrely. So green, green down here to green up here is going to cross over red to red. Um, it's going to be very narrow in some spots, wider in others. Yes, we could do something like that. Um, so, so, so let's, um, and, and so again, this, we, we should say this too. Um, the reason why we're having this conversation is to um, get your thoughts on, are there other hard constraint areas we should consider? Uh, so I think our, as Chris mentioned, he's gonna um, look into that uh, more closely. 
um, our team will talk about it and we will um, we will report back on that. So Chip, thank you for that comment. Um, Dick, you have the next comment. Yes, hi. By the way, yes, that's my correct email address for whoever asked that. Uh, R-P-E-N-G-R-I at gmail.com. I don't know why it didn't go in anyways. Um, thank you. My, my question is, um, the some of the stuff we, we need to see some of the I think we need to see a, a layer with zoning and and the land uses around it because that enters into the conflicts that we've seen with respect to the lease requests and the and the on land um, owners. How so, Dick? I'm sorry. Who answered that? I was just saying. Could you elaborate? Oh. On how zoning would would be. Uh... A hard constraint. Um, I'm sorry, Ben. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. You have zoning. You have zoning maps that are on a town by town basis. You can find them all on the on the town GISs. I think th those show you can you can see the property lines. You can see the zoning on it, and you can determine whether uh, somebody's asking uh, for an aquaculture lease in front of a piece of property that's a residential property that has a right to A, put a mooring on in a, in a type A water uh, or, or a class one water or, or, a, or B, put a dock out in, in any of the reduced classes where there would be a conflict because we have, we have not made those comparisons, at least I, I've made them, but a lot, many other people have not. And I think that that's where there's a lot of, I think that's where the, you have a lot of public uh, conflict from people that we have not been able to reach uh, on, a, on a kind of a uniform basis. Is that better, Ben? Yeah, thank you. So, so Dick, we'll, we will, um, we'll talk about that. As um, Chris mentioned that, you know, we're looking at hard constraints, but also um, uh, information that might be useful um, to CRMC as far as decision making that would potentially fall into that category. Also, do we have on any other information from other people that are using the bay with respect to like the guys that are potting for snails or lobster guys or anything like that? Can we define those grounds? Because that's also been a conflict that I've that's been raised up with me, in particular the, the guys that are wealth potting. Jim, I think you should take that. Well, I know we're, we're definitely going to be working with our colleagues at the Division of Marine Fisheries to work on this issue, Dick. Um, the, the, one of the uh, requirements of considering any aquaculture application that comes through the CRMC is that by statute, uh, we have to receive a recommendation from the Marine Fisheries Council. Uh, oh, yeah, right? yeah, I made it to as, as well as uh, the uh, division itself from the director of DEM. So we need those two recommendations as part of an application moving forward through the process. And as you know, sitting on the shellfish advisory panel, which advises the Marine Fisheries Council as to whether or not there are any conflicting uses with existing commercial fishing activities. So we're gonna be relying on the department uh, to give us that information, but if there is existing information that the Division of Marine Fisheries has that's in a, a, a mapped format, that can be helpful uh, for us in, in you know, looking at areas within the Bay where we have really high intensity uses uh, of uh, you know, other commercial fishing activity. So uh, yes, we're going to be looking at that. Yeah, but I don't think, and I appreciate your response, but I don't think that's going to answer the question. I think a lot of this stuff, the calls that I've gotten from people, be they fishermen or other commercial guys or recreational guys, it's because they have found out about things too late and they've been excluded from the process. And I don't see how, unless it's going to come later, I don't see how we're going to thoroughly try to reach out to the other, to these people where most of the conflicts and most of the complaints are coming from. And I don't know that, that you can go to DEM and say, hey, do you have a layer on the GIS that shows where people are well potting? Because uh, 
I, I don't think they do. But I've, I've been, I've, I've, as I said, I've been called by wealth potters saying, hey, you're, you're giving away aquaculture leases. And that's where I put my wealth pots. And I'm getting pushed out of my soft grounds because it's a nice aquaculture thing. So, um, I mean, I appreciate everything that everybody's trying to do here. But I see a huge swing and a miss with things as a continuum from what I've heard so far. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought this issue up about notification, Dick. And we, we've, we've been thinking about this intently. Um, and, and we know, and for the example you just brought up about wealth potting. So that's the thing with commercial fishing. Um, you know, whether it's wealth potting, lobster pots, right. setting fish pots, whether you're bull raking, you don't work the same exact spot every day. You're moving around. You're moving That's all right. around the bay, yep. right? But there are certain areas where there's very high intensity activity. But nevertheless, the notification issue, uh, we've, heard, uh, we've heard that complaint that people are not getting notified. So what we've done, and we announced this at the last meeting, that we were going to put together, and we have done it, and it is now complete and it is active. We have a Rhode Island aquaculture listserv. I'm on it, I know. Yes, good. And so we've migrated a bunch of folks over um, onto that listserv. Anyone who is interested in a CRMC aquaculture application, whether it's at the preliminary determination level, whether it's a public meeting notice, whatever, it will be up on the listserv. Anyone from the public that wants to be informed on these issues, these meetings, these applications, can go to the CRMC webpage, and that's crmc.ri.gov, and it is prominently displayed right on the front webpage. Click on that button, and you can sign up for that listserv, and you will be noticed from that point forward as soon as you're confirmed as a member of the listserv, you will get all those notices. So this is, this is you know, one way that we can immediately address notifying people who want to be notified. So my question, Jim, is, and I'm sorry to be a pain in the ass, and I know I am, but how do those people know to go to the CRMC website if they're living in their house and they have no idea that somebody's proposing an aquaculture lease in front of them? Well, so that we goes back to- be, We have to be proactive Understood. Understood. And searching out the people, not waiting for them to go to the CRMC website. Well, so this is one way in which we're announcing it and we're going to be spreading this out broadly. But I will also say that our current process, which is in place and has been in place for a long time, when it starts with the preliminary determination, Ben, as the aquaculture coordinator and Dave Butel before him and others before them, send notice to the community where aquaculture is proposed. That community can disperse that notice on their website any way they choose if they feel that they need to notify residents of that community. That's one way they can do it. What we've just implemented now with the listserv is another avenue for people to get notification without having to rely on anyone else. They can do so for themselves. So I, I, this I, is one way that we're trying to do it. And we're certainly open to hearing, you know, some other ways for better communication of this issue. I, I understand. And I, and I do appreciate it. But sending a notification to the Lisa Briars of the world and then saying, hey, Lisa, you can try to send it out to everybody that you think is an affected party or a stakeholder. I don't know that you should put that on the town's back. I think that that's the be- um, Let's say we do have the Rhode Island Aquaculture Listserv, and we'd encourage everyone to sign up to that, and then they will get their own notification, and they won't need to depend on anyone else to get the information. They will get it directly. Um, We are talking about this in a minute. I'd like to finish the conversation about the hard constraints map. Um, When we talked to other individuals um, at the last meeting with East Bay, We had um, someone from the Pilot Association who suggested that we look at another hard constraint um, of a a shipping lane that um, we were not aware of. So again, um, concerning this hard constraint area, we are very open to to considering other existing data layers if you have them. So 
You're, you can either um, let us know verbally here, you can put it, put it in the chat room or the Q&A, or um, you can send it to us after the meeting and, and that will be considered um, and appropriately incorporated into the data layer. So any, any other questions or CRMC members, any other clarification or Chris Damon um, related to the hard constraints map? Um, this again, um, this is not this is an advisory group. We're not voting. So um, so just wanted to point that out. Okay, so we are going to move to the next um, component of the aquaculture element, which again, we, we just sort of started um, talking about it, which is the other revised notification process. Uh, Jim mentioned the RI aquaculture listserv which again, anyone can be a part of and will um, build, receive just like everyone else, um, any, any kind of CRMC information related to aquaculture um, as an opportunity and a, um, a, a way of responding to the concerns that have just been mentioned. Lisa, we saw your comments as well agreeing with this. Um, just to clarify there, the existing, the CRMC process right now is, is legal. There's nothing wrong, but CRMC has said they want to do better and they want to um, be more transparent and so are putting in um, this RI aquaculture listserv. Dick, I see your comment that you'd like to say something. Um, is there some, is there anyone else that has any questions or would like to ask any clarification question? Um, Jeff Gardner, go for it. Yes, and I, I'm not positive this is a, a correct approach uh, for the preliminary determination meetings. I think that's a that is when it goes out to the local community, and I don't know if that's really a good idea to send that to a big, huge listserv when it's an informal meeting. The ones I've had have been an informal meeting in a, a small room in town hall with uh, the town officials and, and the people in the local community that are interested in being involved. I think that might be a little early to put that out to the statewide listserv. And I'd also like to state that uh, since I started doing this uh, 30 years ago now, we are farming in the city. It's like growing tomatoes in Manhattan. There's always going to people that are, the people that are going to have problems with somebody growing tomatoes on the top floor of a skyscraper. And Rhode Island is so densely populated. There's multiple uses that uh, Dick has good points, but we're we're never going to be able to please everybody, and let's just keep the process moving. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, um, Kenny has put um, some um, potential hard constraints uh, or layers for consideration. Um, so, Kenny, we will take a look at those. Um, does anyone else want to say anything about the um, revised notification process? Okay. So, uh, oh, Kenny, is this Kenny? You're saying yes, you have something to say? <laughs> okay. What is, Kenny, what do you have to say about this? No, I cannot hear you. You are um, an, you are a participant. So, um, Kenny, why don't you okay. write in I, your question? I, can, can you get me now? Sorry, I, I saw you let me unmute. The one thing about the notification process, Jim, I appreciate your effort at revamping uh, the aquaculture notification pro process, but I speak from personal experience as a recreational angler that as you put this back on the MFC for recreational angler, anglers, they must give notification also. And for those of us who are recreational anglers, that's a different notification process than what you're doing at the CRMC. So there's a blind spot there. I only found out about an aquaculture lease 
the day of, and it was quite by accident, of an MFC meeting, which was the critical meeting to decide on a recreational fishing spot. So while you are saying that it can be downloaded and um, you know, offloaded to the MFC to decide about recreational angling, there's a complete disconnect with the notification process there as well. So at the very least, for those of us who are tied into this somewhat, um, right now there's a complete blind spot with the MFC notification process. You could ask Ben about that because he was involved in, in, in that specific case. It went right to the MFC and no one, none of the angler objectors to that specific project were notified about the MFC vote. Um, thank you, Kenny, for those comments. And, and, I, and again, I think the, the idea of having this listserv is for anyone who wants to be notified of a CRMC application process, you would get notification uh, starting with the preliminary determination. So what you're describing is you're finding out about a particular application after it had already gone through a preliminary determination process, an application was filed with the CRMC and it was before the Shellfish Advisory Panel as well as the Marine Fisheries Council. By you signing up, and I think you're probably already on the list now, um, you'll get notification at the very beginning of an aquaculture application process. And that begins with a preliminary determination, which is not a permit. It is a process Jim, Jim, for I, I, you know, early learning Jim, about the project. Jim, I completely understand that. But just, just tell me how someone who's a recreational angler would know that it's being your application or that application is being brought up in front of the Marine Fisheries Commission. Well, Marine Fisheries Council also maintains a list of. Ah, okay, good. So yeah. I would have to sign up for the Marine Fisheries Council listserv as well as the CRMC uh, yeah. one it's to the, understand the, the entire Marine, process. It's the Marine Fisheries listserv. So all, all notifications of Marine Fisheries regulation changes, meetings, uh, events go through there. It's a, it's a very general mailing list that includes the Marine Fishery Council meetings as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so yeah. Ben, what, what I'm hearing from you is it's a, it's a parallel process. It's, it's two different processes. The CRMC has its notification process and the MFC has its notification process, yes. but both of those notification processes relate to one CRMC um, aquaculture process. Kenny, you're absolutely correct. And, and, um, and there are two notification processes because there's two sets of regulations that drive those applications. The Marine Fisheries Council operates under a separate and distinct statute uh, for reviewing of yeah. particular applications. But as Ben just said, uh, there is a Marine Fisheries Council listserv. You can sign up. Right, um, right. I, Jim, I understand that. I don't yeah. want to hijack this. We could take this offline. I think you've heard my comments. Yes, and I would understood. just encourage the committee as you're talking about the new notification process to understand there is still a blind spot in the notif notification process for recreational fishermen and the MFC, which is an integral part of your aquaculture process. There's a blind spot there because those who are interested in recreational fishing don't link over to the aquaculture piece, even though you might start this preliminary determination early on. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ken. That, that's thank helpful. You. Yeah, helpful to understand. I, I'll, I will add one thing. I, I do know that Ben sends notices beginning with the preliminary determination to the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association. So hopefully that's a vehicle to notify recreational fishermen at the very beginning of the process. So there will be some redundancy. So I'm going to move on. Uh, we have Deb who has a question. Deb, can you say where you're from, please? Yes, hi, uh, Deb Hagen from Tiverton. Um, in following up um, some of the points that were made for public notice, um, a lot of recreational users who um, frequent waterways in Tiverton might not be on this list. Um, you know, they just pop into our waterways on a weekend here and there. Would CRMC consider any sort of posted public notice? at points of public access. Yeah. 
Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how we would uh, accomplish that. Um, um, certainly something to think about for sure. Uh, I'm just thinking of, of, you know, again, one of the reasons that we um, put together this aquaculture listserv is for anyone who wants to be noticed about particular applications, they'd have the ability to, to get that information early on in the process. Um, I, we'll certainly think about that and consider, you know, how feasible it is uh, you know, to post something that would be weatherproof in a particular location or locations, and then public access points, how far away from the aquaculture site, there could be multiple points. Um, you know, it's like notifying property owners, for example, if it were to fall on the CRMC to notify a property owner, like in a zoning case at a local community, how how far down a shoreline do you go to notify a property owner if an aquaculture uh, it, uh, project is proposed out in waters in front of that town? Is it a quarter mile? Is it a half a mile? Is it a mile? Um, it's just, it, you know, it, there's a lot of um, complexity there to provide that notice. So at least in the interim, we thought that this aquaculture listserv would be a good interim solution for people who want to get noticed can be noticed and you can just sign up uh, through the CRMC website. Sure. Um, my last point, and then I'll mute myself again, is the blind spots that um, other people have spoke about this evening. I think that warrants more discussion and possible solutions to those complexities that you just raised um, would be beneficial. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Deb. Okay. Uh, thank you, Deb. Uh, Julia Livermore. Yeah. So this actually follows pretty well from um, the, the previous two comments. Um, I'm wondering, so the Marine Fisheries Council, will we send out notices on a separate listserv. Um, ben, is that something that would be helpful if I sent that information over to you each time, and then that could also go out on the CRMC? listserv or is that listserv broad enough that that might be a little bit too specific for the larger audience? Um, something we certainly can talk about. Um, I mean, likewise, we could cross both from the CRMC aquaculture listserv onto the marine fisheries listserv as well. Yeah, and um, we have a, the Marine Fisheries Council has a, a meetings calendar, and I don't think we post any aquaculture meetings on it right now. I mean, council meetings where aquaculture may be discussed are on that calendar, but that's another option that we could evaluate. I'll have to talk to the person that actually manages the calendar on our end to see if that would be feasible, but that might be another way to make sure we're kind of cross-posting. Great. Thank you, Julia. Uh, and then Lisa Breyer. Lisa, um, I know you have a question and you also have some comments, I think, about some of the previous discussion or the past discussion. Do you want to? So back when we first started talking about aquaculture sites in Jamestown, there was a situation where um, there was an application that was right out off of our town beach up north, but it was also directly in front of um, an, a waterfront property owner, and it was very close to the shore. And so at the time we didn't, you know, we weren't very savvy to the, the preliminary determination process. And so it just somehow I thought, well, we should probably notify, um, you know, the direct property abutter. And so we did. And so I, I kind of feel like if it wasn't for the town sending them notice and it was just caught by us almost accidentally um, that, you know, it would have it impacted their riparian area. So I think that you know, if, if like when we do zoning applications, it's the responsibility of the um, applicant to give, you know, 200 foot notification. In this case, it could simply be, tell us who the adjacent waterfront owner is. Only one owner, could be two maybe. You don't have to go a quarter of a mile or even a half a mile up the road. Um, just the direct property owner whose repairing area would be impacted. 
and it would be the applicant's responsibility to give that information to the CRMC so that you could easily just send them a notice. And then it would be their responsibility to follow that application through the process. I just think that would be um, something nice. So if they don't happen to know that they, even though there's gonna be widespread um, notification about signing up for the listserv, certainly not everybody's going to do it. Um, and so it's just something I think that at least that one person that is gonna be impacted would at least have direct notification for that. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I guess the question I would have is, um, uh, if if the town for, let let's say for example that um, an applicant um, was required to notify direct abutters, could the town determine who the direct abutters are and provide the list? Yes, absolutely. It's very easy to do that on our on our um, GIS system. Right. So so the then the question becomes. Who is a direct abutter? Whoever the, whoever is impacted by that, you know that um, aquaculture site right out in front of their home. Uh, and what if they're a quarter of a mile down the shoreline, but they they can view the site? Are they? Yeah, I'm not talking about visual impact. That's something yeah. different, in my opinion. I'm talking okay. about directly impacting somebody's repairing area so that they could not wharf mm -hmm. out. They could not put a mooring in. Um, some of these aquaculture sites are very close to the shoreline and it would absolutely impact somebody's ability to do that. And they're paying a lot of money for these properties and they sure. should at least know that it's happening in my opinion. Okay, that's that's helpful input. Um, you know, because one, one of the things that we've talked about and something that we'll um, work through here with the working group is if, for, for example, if we established... Um, a setback, if you will, from say the mean low watermark to an aquaculture uh, uh, operation, you know, establish some zone there um, that might um, preclude uh, interference with a potential dock that might get constructed there, for example, or a mooring if a riparian property owner wanted to put a mooring out in front of their house. So if there was a distance that was established, um, that might become a moot point possibly in terms of, of, of any interference issues. The notification would still be understood, of course, uh, if, if that's something that the town uh, defined as a direct uh, abutter, I, I would imagine it could differ from town to town. So that's gonna be, um, when I say, from town to town, uh, different towns might have different ideas of what a direct uh, abutter might be to an aquaculture project. Um, and, and for example, um, I'm just thinking if you're in a some cove area, um, it could be a horseshoe of property owners. So I, I, I will need to, uh, you know, discuss further uh, sort of a definition of what constitutes a direct abutter that would be helpful so that we'd have consistency in any kind of notification. Sure, um, and I think it's defined at least in uh, the Zoning Enabling Act, uh, direct abutter is defined, I believe. Uh, so maybe yeah. that's a place to start. Yeah, we could certainly start there, but but understanding that it's not um, it's not a landside project that we're talking about here where there's property lines that directly abut this activity. This activity is occurring in tidal waters of the state. So, um, but, but yes, definitely we'll take a look at that. And that's a helpful suggestion. Thank you. So if I can add something to the abutter um, discussion, at this point, it seems that, that this issue is best handled at the town level potentially rather than in a in a blanket uh, something on a on a map right that, that we have here i've worked quite a bit with parcel data across the state and i can tell you that it is always um very challenging this the different towns have wildly different systems for their gis and their parcel lines and trying to make that leap from a a polygon definition in the water 
to the shoreline, it gets complicated very quick trying to do it from, from my side. Um, examples would be if it's out in front of a condo complex, right? Y you don't know who necessarily who all the owners are. You may have one owner for the condo complex in the tax database, um, but there could be, you know, 30 or 100 uh, people living in this complex. So it, it's um, the direct access that we have. Uh, there is no statewide parcel data set, although, you know, we've been talking about developing one for 20 years. Um, so that's just one thing to be uh, cognizant of is we don't have a good way to, to get back into the state databases to figure out who the, the most current owners are. Uh, any, any parcel information we have has been extracted. It's wildly out of date. And so I'm not sure at, at our level in the map that we're looking at, if, if we could ever definitely not in the time constraints, develop a tool that could reach back to the parcels and have an effective um, a butters list generated in, in notices sent out versus the town or putting it on the, the applicant to actually find out who those who owns those yeah. parcels through each individual town's GIS database and then you know having that as part of the application. So just something to be aware of. Yeah. Chris, Chris, knowing your experience uh, with parcel data sets uh, that I, I know that you've worked with over the years, I was certain that you would say that. But you're absolutely right. And I want to put you at ease. We're not going to task you with putting some kind of layer on that identifies property owners. Um, if, we're, if we are to do some type of notification process, we would work with the individual municipalities and have them aid us in identifying abutting property owners so that the applicant uh, uh, could provide that notice to them if that's the route that we're gonna go. Jeff? Uh, there's lots of ways to look at this. Uh, one is, as Chris mentioned, what if you have a big condominium development right on the shoreline? Well, common sense to an aquaculture person would say, well, that's not where I want to be. I'm going to be in people's faces and they're not going to like me. We generally look for places for that salty cove with the marsh grass, with uh, you know, the privacy factor out of, out of the way. Um, kayakers, we like kayakers, but we don't like water skiers and fast boats going by us. And by saying we're gonna notify everybody that has a stretch of land that we can't go anywhere near the shoreline eliminates a huge amount of potential aquaculture sites. Let's say I have 500 feet of waterfront property in Narragansett Bay. I have a single house. Well, to say that that person objects because we're obstructing their view, their riparian rights. Okay, they're all, those are valid points, but there's a compromise involved where 100 feet, say, of that 500 foot of waterfront property will be designated for that landowner's owner's, uh, riparian rights for his mooring, etc. There's also, uh, I believe, in some of the, the, the guidance, you can only be so close to the shoreline if you're doing a particular type of aquaculture. I think the 500 foot uh, distance for high uh, floating gear or something like that is uh, one of the things that has been discussed. So depending on the, the, what you're doing for aquaculture, you could be within 75 feet, 100 feet, something like that of the shoreline of a person's property. But if you're doing something else that's more intensive, then the, the guidance from this should say, okay, we'd like you to be 250 feet over. And if you're gonna be that far and there's a condominiums there, well, it's a lot more complicated than single family homes that are all, all spread out. So there's a lot of nuances to this. It's gonna be a, a little bit of a maneuvering to have this you know, work out right. I don't think it should be necessarily in hard regulation, but there should be some guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Okay, let's continue the conversation. I think, Ben, you're going to do the next um, component, uh, looking at the enhanced navigational and aesthetic guidelines or standards. Standards. 
Yeah, so, um, yes. Right. So as far as, you know, enhanced navigational standards, what I think what we're really talking about there are the release markings. So um, this is a topic that was brought up and discussed at the previous aquaculture working group on regulations, which I believe was in 2009, thereabouts. Um, so there was there was discussion at that point whether we should have a standardized form of, of lease marking. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ideas that were thrown out uh, using you know, large caution uh, type buoys. Um, most, you know, with all that group, I think there was there was a kind of an understanding between the parties that every area is going to be a little different, and what you may be gaining in enhanced navigational aid, you may be detracting from uh, perhaps some of the scenic value of the area. So, so what the way things are now is, is your, your typical lease is marked with uh, standard pot buoys that have the, the ascent number uh, of the lease on them. That is their permit number. Uh, in certain cases, we do stipulate, that is put condition upon the permit that they use something more enhanced than that. Uh, this might be like a, a high-flying radar reflector, uh, so like a metal pole with a you know, diamond shape at the top. Uh, also, uh, sometimes we will stipulate the use of uh, lighted uh, solar power lighted buoys in addition uh, maybe to the high flyer, and that is to uh, you know enhance uh, nighttime navigation. These, these types of uh, devices are usually used on, on floating aquaculture gear that might be um, in an area where, where boat traffic uh, could be nearby. Um, sometimes they're just uh, conditioned on the, the seaward uh, side of the, of the lease so that uh, you know, the side that the boat would traverse across. Um, so there, there is no currently no standard for for what a you know a lease marking should be as far as navigation, um, this is something I think that the group should explore, uh, particularly for the bay, uh, where a more standardized set of navigational aids uh, could be helpful. Um, you know, most of these discussions previously regarding uh, lease markings were were really concerned about the, the coastal ponds, uh, which which have their own you know unique unique uh, challenges there, but. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where we're going with the enhanced navigational aids. Uh, and also, you know, we're going to be talking about aesthetic guidelines. Um, you know, th this is maybe something similar to uh, some of the things that have been said earlier in this meeting, particularly from, from uh, Jeff Gardner, also Jim, uh, you know, Jim Boyd, is, you know, whether we would have a, a, a standardized setback uh, from mean low, low water uh, for different types of deer. Um, this would be to uh, preserve um, uh, some, some of the, the, the visual aesthetic uh, quality of an area. Uh, though I say that uh, with the caveat that aesthetics are, are purely subjective. So it, it, it is something that is rather hard to standardize, but I think we can all agree if something is, is further from, from the shore, it's harder to see and would have less of a visual impact. Um, yeah, so uh, that's that's about all we have on, on this topic right now. Uh, it's something I, I think, you know, the group can explore as, as we move through this process more. Ben, uh, if I could just add, um, you know, this issue came up as you, uh, as you noted, in particular, you know, recreational fishermen who are fishing at night uh, want to be able to fish in areas, you know, bass fishing, for example, at night and um, not run into aquaculture operations. So having lighted buoys on say the four corners of a rectangle um, uh, or these radar reflectors for boats that happen to have radar, um, you know, a lot of boats don't have radar, but at, the, at minimum, if you have solar enabled battery powered lights on the four corners, they would be visible at night. And they don't have to be high intensity lights, of course, but just 
enough to be visible from a certain distance. Uh, and I think the Coast Guard had indicated at the last meeting that they would be able to assist in you know, the proper lighting protocols uh, as what they call aids to navigation. So I'm sure we'll have further dis discussions within the working group on that matter uh, to inc include input from the Coast Guard. Yeah, so that, that's for the, the Payton division at the Coast Guard, private aid to navigation. Um, and I see Bob Rowe put in the comment of, to put it on the navigational charts. This is something that we're actually gonna look into as well. Um, I have started a little bit of internal discussion where, um, after some feedback uh, from other folks about the, is this possible? Um, it, it does appear it, it might be. You know, we, we do have our floating fish traps on nautical charts. Uh, it seems that we, it would be likely uh, that we could also have um, some of these aquaculture installations on also on the, the charts as well. But, uh, but uh, to be clear, anytime you do put out a, a, a lighted buoy or something like that, uh, it does become a private aid to navigation and at bare minimum must be registered with the Coast Guard. I, I like um, Bob Rowe's idea about putting that on a chart plotter. That, that, makes, um, that makes perfect sense. If we can get that kind of um, layer available to chart plotters um, through the manufacturers, I think that'd be great. Yeah, my understanding is we can get it on the NOAA nautical chart. It will end up on the, the information that the chart plotter, the private chart plotting companies use. Great, Ben, so you're all set with that. Um, are there any thoughts on, um, on any other topics that might be um, or could, should or could be covered on this in these guidelines or standards? Is there anything else anyone would like to add to that or think that we should consider? Robbie Hudson? Anything? No, I think like the, what we, we talked about, I think uh, the, the initial kickoff meeting, somebody was mentioning about the radar reflectors and somebody made a comment, you know, not everybody uses radar. And uh, I, I do like Skid's idea about putting on the chop plotters, but then you got to hope that everybody updates the chop plots, you know, the, the graphics. Um, so it, it makes it difficult, but it's, it's all doable. It's another thing. So if you put the lights out there, then the, the, the growers have to realize that they have to maintain it, um, have it registered and so forth, which is uh, all important. I think now you're looking at three different paths to help mark these these locations, which I think is beneficial. And and over the years, we have kind of left it up to the towns. Like in, it also depends on the, the, the lease site itself. Do we have the high flyers, you know, for like the silks leases and other people that have a little bit more deeper water sites or do we go with the lobster pot buoys a little bit more closer inshore um concerns i'm thinking about in the future is if we do have a buffer that says we have to be 500 feet from land we're going to get a whole nother host of 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 uh, conflicts with uh, the regattas that are taking place in the bay all the time you know you know think about all summer long every single uh even during the weekdays there's a regatta going on sometime in the afternoon so uh you know, the more you push away from shore, you're going to run into those. You're going to run into uh, fish lines and traps and whether people are potting and everything else that uh, Dick Pastor was talking about. Uh, you know, it's going to be a, definitely a uh, tough situation. Thanks, Rob. Uh, uh, Bob, you had Bob Rowe. Bob Rowe. Um, yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, so this was a very active topic of discussion at the last um, series of meetings that we had. And what we decided at the end was that this should be decided by the town and the local uh, inhabitants. Because, well, you know, uh, if you're in an area where you've got large boats navigating through, clearly you need to have lights. Um, and if you've got surface gear, but if you've got bottom gear, it's a different thing. Um, if you've got a situation where your lights are going to be creating more of a visual uh, aesthetic jarring impact of the farm than is necessary to protect the boaters, then we need to have latitude to have a, a more subtle marking. So this was um, something that we discussed at length and decided that this should be one of the final things uh, discussed at the town level 
before a lease is granted to determine what the nature of the markings should be, um, keeping in mind the different gear types, the different navigational issues, uh, and, and the different uh, impacts to the aesthetics of the area. And I think those are all considerations that we need to take into account, which led us to the conclusion that this needs to be uh, individually decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so I think that we may end up there again after having some very productive and interesting conversations. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, we do uh, ask the Coast Guard's opinion on, you know, what appropriate marking should be if we, you know, if we feel we need that input. Um, that, you know, I think that led eventually to the, the solar powered lights uh, option that we see now in a lot of leases in the Bay. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you, Bob. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, so those are the three components to the aquaculture element. And uh, unless there's any comments, we're gonna go to the next steps part of the agenda. Uh, so uh, just again, a reminder that this meeting is recorded and uh, we will send you out the recording um, in the next couple of days. So you can um, share that with uh, anyone you'd like. We also will craft like a two page summary notes that you can share. Um, we also have a project website, which will be up uh, in the next couple of days, which has a series of frequently asked questions and more details on the project. Um, and uh, if you'd like to recommend another FAQ, we'd be happy to, um, and if it's an appropriate question, we will put it on the website and um, with a response. And um, so, and just to point, uh, also mention, we did have a uh, uh, aquaculture element meeting uh, on August 12th for Sakonet, but we are rescheduling that uh, due to meeting conflicts. Uh, but so, so we will let you all know if, if anyone's interested in attending that Sakonet meeting, um, we will let you know through the, the, as a working group member, but also through the RI Aquaculture Listserv. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jeff Willis, our fearless leader here, and um, he's going to, Take us out. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for the introduction. Um, apologies for being late, but I do want to thank everybody for making the time. Obviously, I, where I jumped in, I jumped in just before the notification issues, which I thought were very interesting topics for further explanation. And I really enjoy kicking them around and seeing where they can go and, and finding new solutions to ideas that uh, sometimes may become stagnant or some things we just haven't thought about and we need some new ideas for them. So that's what I really value about these meetings and I appreciate that type of input, especially what I heard today on some of the creative ideas on the notification side. Um, and then wrapping it up with how we identify the farm based on the particular area it's in, local knowledge, I think that's just as important too. So appreciate everybody's time. I'd like to explore these ideas in more depth. As we get more and more ideas, whittle them down to the ones that we want to continue working on so that at the quote unquote end of this process, we have a new direction for CRMC to follow and make a much better aquaculture, uh, a regulatory process for the aquaculture industry and for the public as well. So thank you all very much uh, for these great ideas. Jen. Great. Thank you. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting uh, and have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much, everyone.